Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. I sat down with Lynn Hardy, who is the line editor for Rivers of London and an associate editor for Call of Cthulhu. And we talked about what exactly tabletop role-playing games are. They kind of sit in an interesting place between entertainment and education and art and social events. I started off the interview by asking Lynn to explain what exactly a TTRPG is. I'll jump across in the interview in just a moment, but first, please subscribe to our channel and thanks for watching. Good question. Um, I think it can be a little unclear what a tabletop role-playing game is, partly because the definition of a tabletop role-play, well, tabletop game at least, has changed over the last few years. Now, if you'd have said to somebody five, ten years ago, tabletop, uh, they would have automatically assumed a role-playing game, whereas now, just if you say tabletop game, it includes board games and, and everything else. Um, so if you go for a TTRPG, uh, which is quite a mouthful of an acronym, um, I think it's because they're used by different people for different things. So some people use them for entertainment. Some people use them for education. Some people, I mean, let's face it, some of the books are just works of art. So it, it can hit all of those buttons. Is there a central purpose or are there some that stand above others? Or is this really something where you can basically pick any objective for the work that you create or the object that you're enjoying? I think some games are more art than entertainment. Um, it all depends on what your your idea of entertainment is, and that is going to vary depending on who you are. I mean, personally, when I'm playing a game, I want to play something that is fun, something that is entertaining. I don't necessarily want to play something that is going to delve into the dark corners of the human psyche or help me work through various issues in my life but some people seem to really get a lot out of that um and obviously it's it's the phrase horses for courses it depends what you want from your game some games are written to be purely fun and entertaining that doesn't mean that in your group's hands that you couldn't make it something more than that and deal with serious topics and issues some games are very much meant to deal with serious issues um so let's say well Bluebeard's Bride for a start that's looking at um from a very feminist perspective sort of like the, the parts of a woman's psyche um and dealing with issues in that setting so you know and then you've got things like Nobilis which is absolutely beautiful as a piece of art but not necessarily entirely playable depending on which version of it that you've got so again it's one of these Gaming can be all things to all people. It kind of depends what you want to do with it, but certain games are definitely structured to hit certain buttons. Well, let's talk about each of these aspects individually then. Uh, let's dive into education. That's an interesting topic. Uh, games and education aren't necessarily things that go hand in hand. Why are tabletop role-playing games so influenced by education? I think they're actually much better to be used as education, a kind of stealth education. I mean, if you look at a lot of educational games in the market, which I did when I was a lecturer, um, largely because I was dealing with adult students who'd had a very poor educational experience in uh, compulsory education. So it was just trying to find things that would engage them, get them learning without them thinking necessarily that they were learning, just to try and get them past that un unpleasant former experience. And a lot of sort of like games written for education tend to be a bit dull and a bit worthy, if you like. Whereas role playing games, I see you can do a lot stealth education wise with a role playing game. So you can teach numeracy, obviously. Um, you're rolling dice, you're adding up numbers, you're checking things, you're comparing values, you're spending points to create characters, which is helping your addition, subtraction, multiplication. You know, so that's kind of stealth mathematics, um, literacy. It's a good way of getting children reading and um, because if they get invested in the world, they're going to want to read um, critical problem solving. Let's face it, most scenarios are a problem that you have to solve. Critical thinking skills are great, much, much undervalued and much, much needed these days. Um, but also storytelling imagination getting you know sparking children's imagination um so you know in that respect they can be great tools for for language i mean cogs cakes and sword sticks when i did that i used to get people come up to me at various conventions and say how you know they'd they'd used it um 
because it was a very simple fast system they'd used it to help develop children's language skills there was one family they'd actually used it um the it was a three generational family and dad had used it with his mum who'd had a stroke oh. and they and the granddaughter were, uh, and mum and granddaughter were playing um together and and sort of like building their language skills together which you know is a fantastic thing that you, you you know games have all sorts of weird uses that you never really think about um and i know somebody else told me that they were helping um they were using cogs and cakes to help children learn history so you know, you you never know how these things are going to help in terms of basic skills, in terms of specific skills. Entertainment is kind of an obvious one. You know, you, you play games to have fun, at least on a, a surface level, without diving it too deep into any kind of games, academia or anything like that. Is there anything interesting about games that, you know, the, the way that we approach them from an entertainment perspective that you'd like to mention? I think we've covered this before slightly in some of our other panels um, and gaming uh, is a very active participation. It's active consumption because you are inputting into that game. Whereas um, if you're watching a film, if you're reading a book, it's a very passive consumption. Unless you're playing a choose your own adventure book, um, you know, you have no real input into what's going on in there. And even then it's it's limited input because you're still constrained by the paths that are written. Whereas with a role-playing game, that is active engagement. You are actively participating in creating that story, making that world and making your own fun through it. I'd love to ask you a question about a weird part of TTRPG entertainment that I've sort of realized exists recently. I've got behind me fields of books and I, I know that you do too. For me, all of these role-playing books, I've read a good chunk of them, but there's also a lot that I haven't, some that I picked up, sort of glanced through and I, maybe I'll read them one day, but I haven't dived in. I, I don't necessarily, I don't really feel like I'm collecting them, but I feel like I'm getting some kind of entertainment value out of them by proxy. Is that something that you've seen or, you know, are, are aware of? Well, we're all terrible pack rats, let's face it. <laughs> It comes with the territory, you know, if it's not role playing books, it's dice, it's other things, you know, I have a gigantic dice habit. Um, but yes, I mean, there is why, why, why shouldn't you get enjoyment from beautiful things from looking at these books, even if you, you never read all of them, if you never use them to run a game. Let's face it, we have come a long way since the start of this, where you had three, two, three little pamphlets in a little rubbishy cardboard box. Um, that had been typed upon a typewriter and reproduced at a print shop and stuck together with staples and sticky tape. Um, and, you know, these things were functional. They were not necessarily beautiful. Whereas these days, you know, the production standards on books are amazing. I can see some of the ones on your shelf behind you and they're gorgeous. Um, so, and why shouldn't you get enjoyment just from looking at pretty things? You know, there's a lot of work gone into them. And it's nice that the artists and the writers and the layout people get some form of appreciation, even if you don't know their names, just by your enjoyment of looking at the, the finished product that they've produced. So that kind of leads on nicely to TTRPGs as art. Um, I think that we could dive pretty deeply into sort of the academic side of what is art, and we could chase our tails a bit talking about that. But um, do you think that there's a, a more relevant way to approach TTRPGs as art, something that's important to the way that people consume them? Well, we've talked about production values, and they are beautiful. Um, but art doesn't necessarily have to be beautiful. Art can be challenging. It can make you think. And as we've already mentioned, there are games out there that certainly do challenge you and do make you think. And they they again, I suppose, fall into a sort of the educational and art bracket because they're making you re-examine your beliefs, your thoughts, um, your understanding of the way the world works and how things work for various people. Um, so, yes, I mean, it is a vexed topic, isn't it? What is art? And again, as, as entertainment is different things to different people, so is art. I mean, it may be that you, you are of the opinion that art is just beautiful things, and that's great. But your view of art may also be that it should challenge you. It should make you re-examine yourself and your position in the world and things around you. Uh, and certainly games can do that. Tabletop games, live role-playing games, 
they all ask you to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and live somebody else's life, however briefly. And I mean, we know that a lot of the time the characters are pretty much ciphers for ourselves on some level, but there can be a lot to be had from that. It's not psychotherapy, though, I hasten to add. Um, and you've got to be a little bit careful, obviously, about trying to use it as that if you're doing that and you're not trained in that because that can open up a whole can of worms. And that's, again, why safety tools uh, are necessary in specific games. Um, well, in most games, let's face it, um, because you don't want to be delving too deeply if you don't know what you're doing. We've talked about games in the context of art and education and entertainment. I'd like to talk about how they serve as like a social framework as well, too. Do you have any insights you'd like to share on that? The social aspect of gaming is massively important. We know, well, I mean, m humankind is social. I mean, as much as we factionalize and get tribal and things, it's still a social, you know, we are a social creature. Um, and storytelling is a huge part of that. You know, people have told stories throughout our entire evolution. We know this, um, or at least we suspect it. Um, so it is, it's a very fundamental and important thing. And let's face it, the last few years have given us um, a lot of evidence as to the importance of gaming in a social context. We lost that actual physical sitting down at a table, but... Anecdotally, at least, we know that being able to do something like this um, has meant a huge amount to people who otherwise would have been socially isolated because of COVID. Um, it's allowed gaming to, to, to go on. Uh, if anything, gaming in many respects has gone from strength to strength because it's solved some accessibility issues while having others, obviously, because you've got to be able to afford all of this. Um, but it's meant that people from all over the world who wouldn't normally have had the opportunity to game together have been able to come together and tell stories together. Some people um, I know, friends of ours, certainly have been gaming more than they have in the last couple of decades, in the last couple of years. You haven't had to, you know, get in a car, drive somewhere, all of that sort of thing. So it's socially very, very important. And I think gaming has been massively helpful for people's mental health over COVID because it has allowed them to maintain social contact, where in many cases that would have been completely lost through self-isolation for protection. I think that's very well put. I, th I think you're very right. Is there any other things you'd like to add to our conversation before we finish up? At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how you view a game, whether it's as art, education or entertainment. The main thing is that you enjoy what you're doing and it serves the purpose that you need it to at that time. And just because you have an entertaining game one day, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have an educational game another day. It depends on what you need at that particular point.